Welcome to another edition of Power Talk. I think you're going to especially enjoy this session, and I think for a lot of reasons. Number one, the person you're going to have a chance to visit with, along with myself, is a very, very special man. He's brilliant, and brilliant in an area that I think can really make a difference in your life, no matter how successful you already are, and that is the area called marketing. Now, you might say, well, why would I want to know about marketing? You know, I'm not you know, a salesperson. I'm not running that portion of my business, or I'm not part of a business that does that. Well, first of all, all businesses are about marketing. In today's society, where things are so competitive, very often someone having a better product does not mean that they're going to have a better income or that they're going to have a person who's the best at a job is going to keep that job. We're living in a society right now, as you and I both know, where there's downsizing going on, where companies are going out of business very rapidly, and where doing the best job does not guarantee you a sense of certainty about your future. And many people are finding that what they were trained for for years is disappearing. So I think a power talk that doesn't just inspire you, but really gives you some fundamental tools on how you can take control, how you can create a competitive edge for yourself, how to market yourself, or how to take the business you own, if you own one, and market it more effectively, is one that is extremely timely and one that I think can make a difference in your life. The secret, of course, for me was, okay, if I'm going to do this subject, I could talk about this, or I could bring someone in who I have tremendous respect for, who I think is one of the best in the world in this area, and I chose to do that. And we're going to get a chance then to visit with a man by the name of Jay Abraham. And Jay is a phenomenal human being. He's quite articulate. In fact, he may use language that will leave some of us in the dust. I'll have to make sure if he uses some terms that, that I'll be the person to interrupt and say, what does that mean? But he's an amazing man. He is a gentleman, for example, to give you a perspective, who's taken part now in more than 10,000 businesses, uh, more than 10,000 companies are using his principles to run their businesses successfully. He's earned more than $20 million just from his consulting fees in the last 20 years by adding value to companies, by coming in with a brand new perspective about how do you get your message across? How do you get people to want your product or service? So I want to get across a couple things to you. Number one is you listen. Listen carefully for those distinctions that will relate to not only where you are today in your life, but where you will be in the future. Today you may not own a business, but what he's talking about, about how to market a business, you can relate to a future business you may own, or you can relate to the idea of marketing yourself within your own company so you are valued. So if there is a downsizing that occurs, people will see the real value that you have. And the principles he shares are also quite fundamental. They require us to think differently. So I can tell you all about his accolades in terms of his write-ups in the LA Times and Success Magazine and the founders of Federal Express. But I think what's more important is who this man is and what he can share with you. So without any more platitudes, I think I should invite him into this conversation. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Listen, we're here in San Diego, so you may hear some jets flying over our head uh, because we're right next to the Top Gun School, which is kind of appropriate dealing with you, sir. You are a Top Gun. I understand now that you are charged $3,000 an hour for consulting, and most of those done by telephone. You're not even there in most cases. Your seminars often cost between $5,000 and $25,000, depending upon how many people you allow to be in there. What makes you worth this kind of money to businesses and individuals? What do you do, sir? I teach almost any kind of business or professional, Tony, how to harvest the windfall profit that's sitting in every business, and most people don't allow themselves to mine I teach people how to turn one-shot sales into ongoing perpetual streams of income. And I think I teach them how to have a lot more fun basically competing and uh, gaining competitive advantage over everybody in their marketplace or in their industry. I've heard you say many times that you think that virtually every business you've ever looked at, and you've looked at more than 10,000, has between, I think you said, 10,000 and a million dollars of asset of dollars that are just sitting on the table that they really aren't seeing. And quite honestly, when I first read some of your materials, I thought, this is like a lot of hyperbole. But as I've gotten to know you personally throughout the years, and as I've seen the the hundreds and hundreds of cases, I mean, you really have consistently produced those results. Where is this money? Where do we find this within our businesses? Is it really there? Yes. It has to do with uh, an interesting aspect of leverage that not one in a thousand business owners, uh, CEOs, or accountants ever recognizes that the intangible assets, and that means the advertising, marketing, sales, goodwill, customer relationships, distribution centers, and expertises that a company possesses, and ways they could infinitely more effectively, productively use them to their advantage. So let's talk about what that really means. You know, Peter Drucker, like most business people, are both pretty good fans of his. 
And he says that really there are two questions in business. Question one is, what business are you in? And question two is, how's business? Right. <laughs> he said, that's it. I would say there is a, probably a third question, with all due respect to, to Mr. Drucker, and that is, how do you improve business? Which is really the question you tend to answer. He also said that all businesses, they're designed to bring in a customer. That's the only purpose of a business. Right. And that can only be accomplished through marketing and through innovation. That those are the only two functions of business and that everything else is an expense. That's true. So tell me, Let's say you're going to walk into my business tomorrow. You're going to walk into a local entrepreneurship. What would be the first thing you'd sit down to show them how to, quote, harvest these profits that aren't there? What would you do? Let's make this practical. Maybe sure. you give us an example. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I can do an inventory right now. I can do a little self-audit. Would that be useful? Sure. Okay. The first thing I look at is what are you doing that you're not getting leverage enough out of? And, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Every business, knowingly or otherwise, is engaging in certain money-rendering selling or customer or prospect generating processes they don't even recognize, let alone measure and analyze. Until and unless they recognize what they are and they measure how they're doing, they can't begin to see how much better they could be performing. Now, let me stop and talk a little bit about leverage in the new context that we're going to talk about. Okay. Most people, particularly people who have a financial bent, think of leverage as having two quotients to it, upside potential, downside risk. That happens when you buy real estate. That happens when you lease a piece of capital equipment. That happens when you uh, buy any other kind of an investment with a little or nothing down and uh, a future payment obligation. I don't want to deal with that. I want to deal with the most wonderful kind of leverage each and every business person and probably almost everybody who is gainfully employed in any activity to an employer has, and that's upside leverage, parenthetically. It costs you as an employer, as a businessman or woman, as a professional, the same fixed amount, no matter what it is you do to drive business into your company. If you run ads, if you have salespeople, if you generate a referral type of a subtle, understated type of approach, if you do direct mailings, if you have outside field people, if you use manufacturers reps, if you run ads and trade publications, if you do trade shows, whatever you do costs you X to be in business to drive customers right. into. Okay. But that X is a fixed cost and it has no correlation to how the action or the process performs. In other words, you're going to pay that much no matter how much reward you receive. Exactly. The same ad that cost you $10,000 in tomorrow's Sunday LA Times can produce one order or call, 10 orders, 110. The same mailing piece can pull a half a percent response. 3%, 10%. The same salesman or woman can close 1 out of 25 people called on, 1 out of 15, 1 out of 5, 1 out of 2. Correspondingly, that's only the first layer of this wonderful upside leverage everyone has and few people recognize. So explain to me for a second then so we don't, you don't lose me or the group here so I understand exactly what you're saying. You're saying in most investments, I'm going to invest my money and I've got a potential return, but I've got also potential loss. You're yeah. saying in a business... Most time, that loss is very eminent and very frequently occurs. Okay, so, so in other words, there's a, there's a great chance that I'm going to lose my money in the investment unless I'm going to get a very small return. I'm going to put in a savings account or That's a money right. market or something like that. But if I want to get a large return, a decent return, if I want to get a 20% return or more, I'm going to be aggressive and I have a great chance of losing my money or a portion of my capital. You're saying in a business, because of the power of marketing... There are ways of leveraging my money where I get a 20 or 30 or 40 times return for my money. Or 200 or 400 or 2,000. Which I'm really not going to find in any passive investment per se. Well, particularly with zero, with zero downside. Now, how do you get zero downside? I know you talk about this. Well, now, you often say that, listen, if you want to really develop wealth, the way to do it is through you know, your own business um, as opposed to passive investment because the upside is so much greater and there's almost no downside. And yet the reality that we read every day in the newspaper tells us that two out of three businesses that begin five years from now are going to be around. So that's, 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 that's exactly right because they don't use any of these dynamics. Okay, so tell me what you mean then. Uh, how do we achieve this leverage and at the same time produce the level of security you're talking about? Yeah, well, first it comes from analyzing, measuring, identifying and then replacing certain underperforming aspects of your selling, your marketing, your advertising operations with alternatives that perform better. And that's what you're an expert really at doing. I would say so. Yeah. Give me an example where you've done that so we get some kind of a frame of reference. Give us an example where a portion of a business was underperforming or the marketing was underperforming. You came in. What was the result? Okay, I'll give you two or three real quick. Okay. First of all, I've got to give you a, a reference frame. You've got to think about what could be underperforming. 
The salespeople could be underperforming. Okay. Their presentation could not be closing. Their, okay. their direction, the markets they're going after. There's all kinds. You could be having your salespeople work their heart out, but calling on the wrong quality prospect. Okay. You can have them working their hearts out, calling on the right prospects, but making the wrong proposition. You can have them working their, their hearts out, calling on the right prospects, making the right proposition, but not having the right risk reversal to induce people and make it easy to reduce the barrier of entry. You can have all kinds. You can have an ad going off without... I'm going to come back and ask you about risk reversal okay. later, but go ahead. You can have an ad running or a letter going, and because it has the wrong beginning or no beginning, it can underperform its capacity by as much as 20 or 30 times. So what I, I'll give you a couple examples. Years ago, I worked with a brokerage firm that was selling precious metals. They ran ads in the Wall Street Journal. They happened to have had a relationship with a bank that was bank finance. They ran ads for bank finance purchases of silver and gold. The headline said, two-thirds bank financing on silver and gold. When they ran the ads, the ads pulled okay. They brought back a profit. The salespeople made commissions adequate enough to stay. The owners made salaries. The overhead was paid. They had money left to keep running the ads. They were right. happy. Right. But they hadn't questioned how much higher is high. In other words, what's the real ultimate leverage if I really, if these ads could pull more? That's right. If we can improve them. So they began to accept it because it was profitable, as opposed to raising the standard to say, I want a 20 or 30 times return. And that's not only possible, but there's a way to do it. I'm going to find it. And that's what you helped to do. Now, how did you do that? Well, I immediately asked them if they'd ever tested headlines. By the way, most people try to redo ads. That's, that's the most inefficient thing in the world. If an ad basically pulls, the first thing you change is the opening statement. In a, in a fixed print ad, it's the headline. In a direct mailing, it could be a headline, it could be the opening phrase. In a direct selling situation, it's the first paragraph you as a salesperson utter. Same thing if I walk in your retail store. It's the first group of words the person who meet them utters or anything in between. That whole frame of reference, it's burned out but true that you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression. Mm -hmm. So you change that first impression. Right, and the trick is two things. The goal is to make the first statement a statement of the powerful self-serving result the prospective customer is going to receive from availing themselves of your product or service. So this is something else that I've, I've heard you talk about many times, which is that most people think people are buying a product. Not well, true. What are they buying? They're all buying a result. They're buying a benefit. They're buying an outcome that's very self-serving to the end user. People could care why you're in business. People could care if you need to make payroll. People could care if you're the greatest or the worst. They don't want to even be intruded upon. The only reason they deal with you or they let you deal with them is to some extent or another, they see an advantage in it for themselves. The, the greater, the clearer, the more powerful you are at expressing, articulating, demonstrating, illustrating, comparing how you render that advantage better than anyone else you deal with, the more business you get. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, but but in, in truth, though, the secret is being able to do that as quickly as possible, especially in today's society where people get so little attention to something. They want their needs met. They want it met now. That's the purpose of having a powerful opening premise, a headline, a prefacing statement that is either uttered, written, or printed. So back to my story. I got on a tangent. This company had never tested headlines. They were doing great. They thought. I said, well, let's try three, just hypothetically. And I tried three. It took me three minutes to write them. We tested them. One headline changed. One did a little bit better, about 10%. One did about the same. It was negligible. One, improved the yield of the ad they were running by five times, or 500%. Keep, wow. This was back when gold was not selling very high. It was $300 for gold and about $6 for silver. Remember, they were saying two-thirds bank financing on silver and gold. Right. Keep in mind, my question is always, but what does that mean to me as right. the customer? It meant nothing. So what? I changed the headline. All I said was, if gold is selling for $300 an ounce, Send us just $100 an ounce and we'll buy you all the gold you want. I had one for silver. If silver is selling for $6 an ounce, send us just $2 an ounce and we'll send you all the silver you want. Wow, well, what a great change of meaning. It was the people. same statement, but more powerfully denominated in the context of what's in it for me. Right. What's the result? How do I benefit? Right. That one simple change. It was all about 12 words made the same amount of space they were buying, the exact same amount of body copy, which was 90% of the ad, not pull $50,000 every time they ran it, but start pulling 250000 And I was getting a profit share, and they sent me thirty grand a month for about, I don't know, 12 months just from that one change. But that's one example. Another example. I teach people... It was a good three minutes. It was good. I teach people, <laughs> I teach people how to 
identify, analyze, and measure what I call the marginal net worth or the lifetime value of a customer. When I meet people, I ask them a couple of questions, and it's pretty amazing. The first question I say is, in a minute or less, tell me what it is about your business that gives greater advantage, greater benefit, greater result to your customer than your competitors. And most business owners will say nothing, or they'll say quality, service, dependability, which, everybody says. which is negligible, or it doesn't mean anything. Well, the next thing I ask them, and I'll get into that later, the next thing I ask them is, what is the lifetime value of a customer? And they look at me, and I say, well, let me ask you this question. How much do you spend for advertising? How much do you spend on selling? How much do you spend on promotion? And they'll say nothing or they'll say X. And I'll say, well, how do you formulate that? And they'll say, well, we just sort of allocate it. And I'll say, well, doesn't it make better sense to first of all figure out what a customer is worth to you, worst case, the first time you sell them? If you sell 100 customers, not the best, what's the average worst case going to be that they're going to be worth in unit of sales and then a corresponding profit? Of those 100 customers, how many will come back if you do nothing else but just let them just migrate the way they do in month one or month two or, mm -hmm. or, or year one, how many will go year two, et cetera? What will the projected long-term value that each customer is to you in, in net bottom line profit be? No one ever looks at that. In my mind, until you know what a customer is and will be worth, you can't possibly understand how much you can afford to do or spend to acquire them. Back at the story. I had a client, a fascinating little client. They sold fluid transmission products. You know what that is? Yeah. PVC pipe that carries sure. fluid for manufacturing, for ag agriculture. They came to me and they said, oh, oh, it's for, for Lauren. They were almost out of money. They had six salespeople doing whatever they wanted to do, not managed, trying to sell farmers and manufacturers. And they had a compensation program. It was pure commission. The salespeople got approximately 10% of the profit. If they made $1,000 on something, the sales would get 100 the, the house or the company would get 900 they said, well, what can you do? Come up with some brilliant idea. I said, it doesn't need to be brilliant. All you got to do is tell me what the lifetime value or the marginal net worth of your customer is. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, go back and come back in a week and tell me, first of all, what the average worst case new customer is worth to you in unit sale the first time. Worst case, how many times that customer will buy from you in the first year. Worst case, how many years they'll be with you. They were shocked. They came back. They did a reconstruction. Turned out that the, that the worst case, the customer, I'm not going to tell you the gross sale because that doesn't matter. From a profit standpoint, the initial first sale, on average, worst case, was about $200 gross profit to the company. Right. Of that, 20 went to the salesman or woman, right. 180 went to the company. On average, the average customer bought from the company, let's see, five times a year for three years. Wow. So it was basically, each time they got a new customer in the door, they were accruing $3,000 in cumulative profits they'd never recognized. I said, well, your problem's simple. They said, well, what? And I said, all you got to do is set up a basis with your salespeople where as long as they keep their production levels from their existing customers at or above what they've averaged in the past, give them 100% of the profit on every new sale that they accrue. They'll be 10 times more motivated to bring in new customers than they were in the okay. past. So they make $200 instead of $20. But every time they made $200, the house was accruing $2,800. 20, yeah, 2800 right. And they said, well, it won't work. And I said, try it. Make a long story short, it tripled sales. It was, took me about three minutes to figure that out. It doesn't have to be that hard, Tony. Let's talk about uh, the business you did with Icy Hot. I think that's another good example of this. And what we're really talking about is leverage. How do you really get a result that's multiplied many times just by using some ingenuity? I mean, this is what I call regeneration. You're taking these dormant resources, you're using human ingenuity to look at it in a brand new way, redeploy those assets in a new way, and get a tremendous increase in the quality of life, either for the business or your life. I also want to relate this to people who maybe don't own a business, because people who don't own a business still have resources within themselves that have to re be redeployed. Some of the same ingenuity, oh, some of the same thinking process. They're not leveraging their time, they're not leveraging their creativity to get the greatest result. Or their knowledge base or expertise. Well, give me an example of that then. Let's talk about what kind of sure. individual who doesn't own a business. And actually, I'm, I'm bouncing around here. Doesn't I want to give me an example also of this uh, business Icy Hot, because I thought that was a great example of leverage as well. Okay. Why don't you start with that, and then let's talk about what we can do for an individual. Yeah, there's three stories. The first story is most people, they allocate in their business a budget. It can be a sales budget, it can be an advertising budget, it can be a marketing budget. I've learned from masters that you have an infinite upside budget if you stop looking at budgetary figures and start looking at, at allocating an allowable cost 
per sale or per lead or per okay. transaction. So instead of saying we've got $100,000 in our budget here to produce sales for this particular event or situation, mm-hmm. I want to say I've got a certain number of people. I'll spend $25, up to $25 a prospect or up to $100 a sale, and you can bring me all the sales you can for because that. Because I know that there's a back end. Because you've analyzed and you right. know the residual value, the, the stream of income, the lifetime value if you do nothing else. And that day, we're going to get really excited later. We can show you 20 different things you can do to make that higher. But if you do nothing else, you understand that. So I worked with a company that sold a patent medicine like Bengay or Mentholatum that was called Isiat. It still is called Isiat. It's a glob of gelatinous goop, a bomb of, of menthol, menthol salve. And it happens to have a very good therapeutic external effect on bursitis, neuritis, arthritis, and other kind of rheumatic type things. And it's a temporary and a very blessed relief giving product, quite a a good qualitative product. We bought this old company that had almost no business. We were going to put it under and just use its facilities, but we kept getting letters and letters and letters from little old men and women who'd been buying it for years and years, begging us to keep selling it because it was the only thing they could use to get their arms moving and their legs walking and their pain subsiding. So we decided, okay, let's try to build this. We didn't have a lot of money, and we had, but we had this philosophy of not paying for advertising, paying for results. Product sold for $3 for a jar. We went to advertising mediums galore. We went to 1,000 radio stations. We went to 200 television stations. We went to about 100 magazines. We went to, I think, 100 catalog companies and mail order companies. We went to all kinds of other non-traditional forms of selling you wouldn't even understand. And we went to them and we said... If you will offer our product for sale to your customers, first, it will not be any kind of a competitive product because it only adds value. Sure. Number two, it sells for $3. You may keep 100%. Everyone thought we were crazy. What? Selling something for $3 and, and not making even the cost of producing the goods? So you actually, I mean, you gave them the product for free, let them sell it and make all the profit. And keep the money. And keep all the money. All we asked them to do was send us promptly the name and the address of the customer so uh-huh. we could make certain that customer got their product promptly and were satisfied. Uh-huh. Now, why would we do that? Because we had analyzed from the past what the residual or marginal net or lifetime value of a customer was. And we found out that every time we brought in two, one of them would migrate for about 10 purchases a year and make us about $25 net, net, net. Every time we gave up, not $3, because it wasn't costing us $3, it was costing us about $0.45 cents in volume to make the product, put it in a jar, ship it out bulk rate to the customer. Every time we sent it out, we sent it out with a coupon offering all kinds of other things. And on every 100 ones we sent out, we not only would get back 50 orders, but we'd get back another 20 orders for other products we have. So it was a cash flow loss of $0.45, cents, but from a practical standpoint, after the first group of sales, we were all ahead of the game. And every time we got new customers, they would repurchase over and over and over and over again. And we never had a budget. We had an unlimited budget because we would only pay for sales, not advertising. Hmm. We just basically said, keep all the $3. It got to the point where it, as sales slowed down, we paid $3.45 for them to sell $3. Oh, my gosh. They thought we that were crazy. That makes total sense. Yeah, but that makes total sense. But we built a company from $20,000 to $13 million in 18 months. It sold for many tens of million dollars to uh, G.D. Searle, a big pharmaceutical company. You can still find it now. Uh, we accidentally, by the way, we got $18 million of free advertising that didn't cost us a dime the first year through this because we didn't pay for advertising. We paid for results. It's a whole yeah. different way of looking at business. It's fantastic. Now, that, that's the kind of leverage you're talking about where it's only upside. There was no downside for you in this no. versus any investment you and I were going to make. There's always going to be a risk. So exactly. there's still some risk here, but it was pre- pretty muted. Well, see, you understand, the, the, the only risk you ever have to have in anything you do is an inexpensive test. If you test variables in your business, so getting on a new tangent, but this is fascinating, most people don't test anything. Most people make decisions that cause or cost or, or impact the entire fate and destiny of an enterprise or a career or a life based on conjecture. I will not do that. Um, I did it once. It cost me a million six, but I won't do it anymore. Basically, what I learned is every aspect of a business can be tested, can be measured, can be examined, can be compared, can be improved just by trying one way of doing something against another. One headline against another can be 21 times different. One price point against another could be as much as 10 times different. One way of articulating or presenting or stating your proposition against another could be five times difference. One price point 
can pull three, ten, fifteen times difference. One way of stating or illustrating a guarantee can pull three to five times difference. Well, if you keep testing things like that, it's not just you've gotten twelve times different or five. It's an exponential because they all work together. That's how you get three thousand, five thousand pieces in a business. Well, in a what's business. interesting is the thing that stops people is I don't think most business people realize that one the power of one distinction the power of one slight change i think most people think about improvement in terms of constant never ending improvement maybe at the very best or oh, we're going to keep making this thing a little bit better instead of saying there is a way and i just need to find it of organizing my resources articulating or marketing what i'm doing that would bring mass number of people here it's the mindset that seems to stop people it seems to me how do you help people we said business is marketing and innovation how do you teach businesses to innovate? And I also, maybe I can tie into this. You say there's really only three ways to grow a business. Let's talk about that. How do you really grow a business exponentially? Well, as you know, my biggest plight in life is people don't believe that I can do what I do because they say, well, you can't grow a business and double or triple it in, in, in a year. You can't, you can't make an extra $200,000 when all we made was $100,000 all of last year. But it's not me. It's a function of how little they demand out of themselves and their investment, human and financial, in their business. So how you grow a business is very simple. There are only three ways to grow any enterprise. It doesn't matter what business you're in. You either increase the number of customers or prospects, you increase the unit of sale, or you increase... When we say unit of sale just for everyone, you mean by unit of sale what specifically? Okay. Whatever people buy. If they buy something from you, you look at what's the average unit of purchase. Do people buy $100? They buy $1,000? Whatever it is, that's the unit of sale. Okay. So you increase the number of customers. That's the first way you can increase your business, grow right. your business. You increase the unit of sale. You increase the frequency of purchase, or stated otherwise, you increase the residual value that customer is worth to you. So in other words, we've got to either figure out how to drive more people in the door, right. or we've got to raise our price potentially or get more money each time we finally do make that sale, or we've got to be in a position where we make sure yeah. there is a back-end sale, that once they bought that product, they're going to buy our product again and again. So the money we spent to get that customer is means little to us because we've got a lot of profit on the back end. But here's the exciting point. Do any one, and you can grow geometric. Right. Do any combination of, of the three, and you grow exponential. Case in point. Most people doing nothing, with no formal understanding of any of these dynamics, principles, distinctions, marketing, anything, left to their own devices over whatever period of time they've been in their business. They have gotten to a point where they have evolved to where they have a finite number of customers, whatever it is, X. Those customers left to their own without any direction, any great sales ability on the part of the companies, any programming, any experimentation. They've evolved to where there's a certain fixed unit of sale that's average, and they buy a certain number of times without anybody doing anything. If all you did was become a little bit more effective, a little bit more proficient, a little bit more adroit at selling, you could probably close a few more customers. And it sure. doesn't take, I mean, you probably double it because most people are so inept, but the, that's not meant to be disrespectful. It's just a statement of it's like. Well, you've experienced with 10,000 yeah, businesses. That's right. 99% <laughs> don't do any of the things they could. So I would say you could probably get almost anybody a 40, 60, 80% increase in, in category one, the number of customers, but let's say all you did was get them 10%. Okay. Same thing with the unit of sale. Doing nothing, the average person buys X. If you got them with a little bit of programming, a little bit of value orientation, a little bit of result understanding and positioning people to realize what they were getting out of it as a customer, it's not hard to get your unit of sale up 10%. Right. If people are buying, coming back on their own volition X times a year, if you just program them, if you gave them a basis. What do you basis, mean program them? What do you mean? Well, I mean, when people start a buying relationship, you have an inordinate opportunity to ethically program people for forever. People are coming to you for guidance. If they favor you with their purchase, it means they trust you. They look to you to have ability, expertise, integrity. If you, at that point, show them the reasons why in their self-interest they should be coming back and repurchasing your product or other services or the logical extension, what the frequency should be, just connect to them or give them an inducement at the point of purchase or on a cumulative basis, like frequent flyer miles or something, to get them to keep coming back at a certain okay. number of intervals, you normally will get many more what I call turns per year or purchases. And that can be incredibly Im impactful to growing your business. But if you only increased it from whatever it is now by a lousy 10%, remember we increased the customers by 10%, Right. we increased the unit of sale by 10%, we increased 
the repurchase frequency by 10%. Okay. What have you done for your business? Remember I said if you do any one, you grow geometrically. Geometrically, right. But if you just increased all three categories by a mere 10%, you haven't grown 10%. You've grown 33 and a third percent. And that 33 and a third percent could be all the profit the business makes. So the profit could be massive. If you grow each one of those categories more, grow 125%, 118%, 122 percent the cumulative effect is like 90% increase in your sales. You've gone wow. exponential. And when we get companies to go triple the effectiveness of their selling or bringing in customers or prospects, doubling or tripling their ability to get the unit of sale. And unit of sale does not necessarily mean you raise your prices, although sometimes when you do that, you get more business. It means perhaps bringing together a greater advantage and a better package that sells for more, that gives the customer more sense of value. Or they might buy more That's of right. units. Or getting them to purchase and commit now and take delivery in lots over the future, but something that gets the unit of purchase to a higher level. That it's easier to be exponential than it is to be geometric. It's easier to grow massively than it is to grow slowly. It's easier to be successful than it is unsuccessful. How can you say that? I agree with you, by the way, but I've got to play devil's well, advocate that's okay. here. <laughs> well, because I guess it goes to, be, to the fact that I've seen how few people understand how to optimize their time, their money, their opportunity. The moment you understand that, you've got a clear playing field because you can do things that are so much more effective. You can make a dollar go so much further. You can make a customer last so much longer. You can make an activity produce so much greater current, future, and this is going to be wild, reclamational benefit that it's like it's no contest. Well, you've opened up several loops there for me to help close. Let me, let me come back to it then. What stops people... From optimizing, because that's really the term we're really talking about here, is how do you really optimize? What okay. is optimization? Let's well, talk about let, that. Let me tell you what stops it. And what stops it? Mindset, gonna, right? I'm going to say this. Their expertise. Mm. They have too much expertise, too deep. It's the difference between tunnel vision and funnel vision. Hmm. Most people have been in their, their, their career or their field or their business or their profession so long, they know it so well, but all they know is the way that their industry operates. If you look at any field, a widget company, a retail company, a professional practice, a manufacturing industry, almost everyone competing in that industry, every player, every separate competitor is doing plus or minus about 20% the same thing, the same way. Some are more proficient, more able, more skilled in a selling, in a marketing, in an advertising, in a reselling, in a, et cetera. But they're that, all basically doing the same thing same the thing, same, the same way. way. Right. Why? Because they have such expertise technically, but all they know is what they know, and, and all they know is what they see other people doing because they used to work with somebody else, or they tutored or interned with somebody who used to work with somebody else who learned it because they learned it from somebody else who a generation or a decade ago did it the same way. I've been privy of looking at 400 separate industries. When you look at 400 separate industries, you, re you get two things. It's like traveling. You travel outside of Los Angeles, you see there's a lot of different lifestyles than the one in L.A. When you travel outside of California, you see there's a lot of different climate and a lot of different values. When you travel outside of the United States, you see that there's a lot of different cultures, a lot of different values, a lot of different work ethics, a lot of different climates, temperatures, exotic things. It gives you, you, it gives you a broader selection of choices for your life. As and does, possibilities. And why, exactly. It gives exactly. you a reference frame. You call it many more distinctions. When right. I got the privilege of traveling amongst 400 separate unrelated industries, I saw, to my fascination, the fact that if you look at 100 industries, almost 95 of them drive their enterprise, bring in their customers, run their operations from a totally different marketing context than, than one another. In other words, industry A operates from a marketing aspect totally different than industry well, give B. Give me an example. Okay, great. Let's take a manufacturing concern. Most of them basically sell with either manufacturer's reps or ads in trade publications or going to trade shows. That's all they do. They don't telemarket. They don't do direct mail. They don't do joint ventures with other people that already have their customers. They don't basically get endorsements in, in publications. They don't do any of the possibilities. But certain people, if you look at the basic 10 ways most people drive their business, and when I name these 10 ways, there may only be five when I, when I tally them, you'll find that every company... Or every industry has, they can relate, they can resonate. One of these ways is going to be how 80 or 90 or 100% of their business emanates. 
Way one might be running ads in consumer publications. Way two might be running ads in trade publications. Way three might be generating leads and converting them through direct mail or through telemarketing or through some other kind of mechanism like a trade show. Mechanism four might be telemarketing. Mechanism five might be retailing. Mechanism six might be a catalog. Mechanism seven might be separate subcontract representation. I can name probably 25 if I was asked to. You will find that almost every business has one of them that is the predominant way they drive their business. I see. So that's their primary focus. They don't even understand the other. The real estate industry, they've got a realtor out there who's going out there and doing it using some of these tools. And most realtors basically knock on doors cold, they yeah, sit no, or they run ads that nobody reads and that doesn't have any offer of any benefit or result that's in, in, in store for the reader who might want to buy or sell a home, or they stand for 12 hours quietly and silently and vacantly in an in a open house that no one comes to see. <laughs> you make it sound so compelling, Jay. <laughs> well, to me, it's just a, such a dissipation of effort, energy, and the most precious commodity we have so what would you is do time. With it? So what would you do with that realtor? To have that realtor be more effective. They would use some of these other avenues of marketing. That I would are teach untapped. them leverage. Okay, so what, let's, look at, let's think about it. We've got this realtor right here. What would you, how would you teach them to leverage their time or their well, effectiveness? The first thing I would do is go back in time, which is what I teach. You asked me about, I'll draw a parallel. Any company I look at, the first thing I say is, how much more can you do with the customers you've got? Can you resell them? Can you sell them more times? Can you sell them more things? If you have nothing else to sell them, can you sell them? products or services that align, the complement, that are synergistic to what they sell. I go to a realtor and say the following things. Number one, have you sold anybody's house in the last two years? If the answer is yes, before I do anything else, I'd say, are they happy? And if they said they don't know, I, said, I would say, you obviously didn't do your job correctly because part of your job is to make them see and seize the great advantage you have rendered them that nobody else could have made. So we go back and teach them how to express to customers of theirs or clients from now forward how much of an advantage, how much of a benefit, how much of, of a greater result they will get or they did get or they should get by favoring this realtor over everybody else. In other words, this realtor is going to add value in a way no other realtor would have. And if they don't understand how I'm going to teach them how, and that takes a little time to explain, but we can get into that in a minute. Number two, I'm going to go back to all the old customers they ever called on. And we have them contact them all and reiterate to them so they can better appreciate what they did for them in the process of selling their house, of representing them, of negotiating the purchase. So they have a greater appreciation. So it becomes evident when they ask this question, do you think you were benefited? Do you think you were advantaged by having me serve you instead of somebody else? The moment you position them to say yes, you ethically set them up for the next question. And in the scope of your life, Tony, you must at any given point, knowing the moving parade of life, meaning the changes, the, the continuum going up and down, you must have an inordinate number of friends, of relatives, of co-workers, of church members, of associates, who are either because of changes in their life, because of children moving out, because of deaths, because of divorce, because of improvements in their, in their stature, are either in the process of wanting to sell or wanting to purchase a home or a second home or a different home. If the answer is yes, and as you just agreed, you feel that I benefited you better than anyone else, the greatest service it would seem like we could do for them, you and I together, is to contact them and at least get them to seek out my best research, professional opinion on what the best strategy of action, what the best approach they should take, what the best sites they should set on would be, irrespective of whether they buy from me or not. And I'd program them to go back and get their customers to sell for them, because that's the greatest leverage in the world. Now, some people say, well, that's pretty basic. That's just, you know, creating referrals and getting them to do that. But uh, what's your answer to that? And well, when, when you ask people how they get referrals, most people say, I ask people to give me the names of people I could call on. That's not what I said to it. Right. What I said is you go back and you first reestablish or establish for the first time the distinction of the inordinate value you brought to that person or you will bring to that person because of the effort, because of the expertise, because of the performance, because of the knowledge, because of the representation you're going to render that no one else could. You get them to concede what that is worth to them in both intangible and tangible terms, in pleasure, in protection, in exhilaration, in getting a bigger house and having no problems and selling and not having to worry about it falling out of escrow and whatever they're not going to worry about. Right. Then you get them to, to, to dominate it in dollars. That isn't it true that I probably, because of the work we did and the strategy we had, probably got you the house at the best price possible? Isn't it true you probably saved twenty or thirty or fifty thousand dollars? Or isn't it true that we thought originally we might have to get two hundred thousand, but instead by using the strategy we worked out together and me holding true and you respecting me for it, we got you next to thirty five. So you denominate what it really meant to them in terms. 
So they see it as being a real value, as something that, that is tangible. As I call it a sandwich. Half feeling, half real perceived tangible value. Okay, interesting. So you do that. Once you do that, it That becomes, gives you the leverage for the person to really want to, to help you, and because they're not just helping you, they're helping their friends is the truth. You're talking about it in terms of their self-interest not even help. Again. It's a moral issue. I mean, you have a choice. If you have a friend and you know that friend, and that friend is important to you, you have two choices. You can allow that friend to make the wrong decision and pay $30,000 more. You can allow that friend to sell his or her house to somebody, and because that somebody doesn't give them great representation, they may let him sell it out for twenty or $30,000 less. You can allow that friend to trust somebody who's in such a hurry to do the deal that it gets all screwed up in escrow and falls out, and the friend gets all screwed up and may compromise, or... You can take it upon yourself because that friend is important to you and you trust and, and revere the friendship and you want their life to be enriched and benefited to put them in touch with me, couldn't you? <laughs> yes, Jay. <laughs> no, I mean, that may be a little evangelical, but that may be a little over, over-dramatization, but that's the way I, I, I believe it. But I, and and the, your passion comes through. Now, now, the truth is, if you were talking to someone who didn't define themselves as a realtor but define themselves as an entrepreneur... The reality is you probably would go back to that person and say, what other resource does that person need? Not just the additional customers they could bring to you through referral process, but you'd be probably looking at ways in which to leverage your relationship to meet other needs that they have through products or services, wouldn't you not? I would. The first thing i do, because most people never, I mean, you talked a little bit about optimization. Can I introduce that yeah, and come back? Yes, please. I believe, I've been very lucky, I've been very influenced by you. I think you're brilliant, and I think you're, you're um, demanding that people challenge themselves to see how high is high is a wonderful breakthrough. I've also done work with a lot of other people, as you know, who, who were seminal thinkers in different fields. And I got the privilege of working with the people who conducted the seminars for W. Edwards Deming. I think sure. he was a seminal thinker. And I think what he, his thinking was more powerfully applicable for entrepreneurs and professionals than it even was in manufacturing. Mm-hmm. He extolled a philosophy of optimization, which in my in my paraphrasing is basically you should never do anything unless you can get the maximum benefit, the maximum yield currently and forever from the minimal waste and the minimal effort. And in order to do that, you've got to understand a couple of, I guess you'd say, distinctions. First of all, everything a business does is a process. And as a process, it can be measured, it can be compared, it can be quantified, it can be improved. Give us examples. Okay. You own the business. You called on customers in the past probably to start the business. You probably started it, and when it was a small business, you didn't have a sales force. You probably were it. You became so adroit, so adept, so capable at calling on people and perhaps unconsciously or subconsciously presenting the greatest advantage to them that you probably had a very high success rate of both closure, meaning if you called on 10 people, you probably sold five, and the average person you sold probably bought $1,000 or $2,000. Okay. But most people probably aren't as passionate, as clear, as demanding, as capable. Your average salesperson now might need to call on 25 people to sell one, and his or her average sale might be 200 instead of the 1,000 that you average and could go out and average tomorrow. Okay. Okay. You run an ad. You run an ad in the LA Times. That ad produces 50 responses. You run an ad in another publication. It only produces 10 responses. Those responses come in. One time you'll close 50% through whatever process. Telephone selling, sending out literature, giving them brochures, going in their home, having them come to you. Another time you only sell 20%. Well, there's processes galore. You've got to measure and analyze what processes impact your business, what the dynamics are. There are two sets of dynamics. One, the dynamics that bring action to bear, and then two, the dynamics that impact the dollars that keep flowing in. In other words, certain factors bring more or less people in or convert more or less right. people. Other factors impact the dollars those people spend and the frequency or the continuation of that so expenditure. So you're back end again. Yes. Okay. So you got to measure all that. Okay, so that's one. That's the first principle we got okay. from Deming. Okay, so what you do, you measure it. So whatever you do, whatever you, you are right now is what's called your baseline. Whatever it is, it is. You know, you know if basically on average, and the key is on average, on average when you run an ad, that ad basically you spend $5,000, it brings in 10000 That's your baseline. If on average when you make a presentation or you get 250 prospects or 50 prospects come in your facilities or you call 50 prospects and you convert X, X is your baseline on right. average. Right. Whatever the unit of sale is your baseline. you got all these baselines. Okay. Your goal is first of all to identify what your baseline is and then identify what the variance is. And the variance is the differing performance levels that occur 
when other people or other mechanisms are used and some are better and some are worse. Okay. Your goal as a business owner is very simple. It's to raise the baseline and lower the variance. Okay. So how do you do that? Great question. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> you test conservatively differing ways of doing each process to try to get improvement. And when you get improvement, you do one of potentially two things. You either replace what was working or what was your baseline or what we'll call your control process in a category right. with that which produces greater or, and this is where people really drop the ball, sometimes they're good enough to find a better control and they drop what was working before. You don't necessarily have to drop what was working as long as it was profitable because it may be impacting a different segment of a trial market. Okay. You may want to build a broad base with different pillars. Right. Is that getting too complicated? No, no. I think you're on track there. So in other words, one of the things that, that you've talked about in the past is that if you're going to be effective, not only have you got to measure what you've got, you've got to know exactly what you can count on, but you've got to be able to find a way to leverage. you get a greater result. So I think we've talked about That's what gives that. you predictability to your business and future People don't say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. You know exactly what you're going to do in the future, plus or minus a small variance, once you measure, quantify, and project out. Plus, you know, you can't manage something you can't measure. That's right. And, and the truth is you can measure almost anything, but people have never really been taught to do that in it's business. It's very easy. Now, one of the things that you've said in the past is the major reasons businesses fail is because, as you said earlier, most businesses have one primary way to bring customers in, and then if something disrupts that, and something external, something in the government, something in the economy, something, a new kind of competitor, maybe a worldwide or international competitor, suddenly that business is in trouble or it literally goes out of business. That's true. Let's describe for us that dynamic and, and what's the solution to that dynamic. How do we make sure that we have long-term, not only predictability, but profitability in any business enterprise we're a part of? Okay. Well, I'm going to use two graphic analogies. I believe you build your success foundation I'm going to call the diving board analogy versus the Parthenon. Okay. Okay. Most businesses I look at, and I shudder to say most of the businesses or the business owners or the professionals listening to this tape would be what I call the diving board. Imagine a diving board that has one post holding the board. The board is your foundation. The post is the method or the mechanism you have either consciously or unconsciously depended on to generate and drive and fuel all your, your sales, all your customers, all your sustained growth. Okay. What is a diving board by nature? What does it do? It goes down. If that one pillar that you've built your business on either gets saturated, stops being effective, gets competed against because someone else starts becoming more proficient, remember the 10 to 15% better or worse? Right. Somebody does it better than you. Your business is over. I believe the diving board collapses. The diving board collapses because diving boards won't are, hold you up anymore. They go down. What are you diving boards used for? Not going up. <laughs> okay. And too often times people do a perfect triple off the high, but there's no water in the pool. So, <laughs> so basically, my goal for a client or any company or my wish for anybody listening to this interview is that you systematically, and as part of this concept of optimization, which I'll go back to in a minute, you systematically create your business to be based upon multiple pillars that support it. One pillar can be whatever it is you do now. The next pillar will be another alternative form of selling or of generating business or of lead generating. Another pillar, so it could be that one facet of your business is direct selling. Another facet could be telephone marketing. Another facet could be joint ventures or strategic mm -hmm. alliances. Another facet could be a different kind of direct selling right to the customer. Another facet could be joint ventures with manufacturers reps. Another facet could be contingency or shared revenue type selling with advertising mediums, radio stations, publications. So in other words, if, if now, if one of these pillars goes out... It's a nagging inconvenience, reason. but it maybe it'll annoy you and eliminate 10% of your, of your business, but it will not debilitate or, or terminate your, your ability to exist. Or interesting. Subsist. It's fascinating because I, my business career started out with my desire to share ideas that I thought would make a difference in people's lives and it started out with one avenue which was one-on-one -on -one consulting working with people and then gradually it grew into the seminars and then gradually I began to realize I've got to have if I'm going to have my the goal really reached I've got to have multiple ways to impact people so that's how we grew into writing books and I looked around at other people they're just authors I said no I don't want to just write books I want to have access to be able to change people's lives through books and profit from that I want to be able to do it through audio tapes I want to use television as a source I want 
to make sure the airports are a source of that kind of avenue. I want to make sure I have some outside promoters. I want to build my own team. And it's paid, it's paid off. You yeah, told me I, you have- I was a point in my career early on where I was totally dependent upon outside sources and some of those promoters went out of business, and that's why I built the company, because I said, I don't but ever you saw, want to but be you dependent. you saw firsthand this happening. Oh, it's amazing. It's you so also painful. have another permutation. You could have started your business perhaps just working with people who had a bad habit they wanted to end. But now right. you appeal to a broad spectrum exactly, of different... Not only did I get multiple channels of distribution, but I said, I want to help people emotionally, I want to help them financially, I want to help them physically, I want to help the predominant, most important areas. I want to be able to help turn businesses around. So you're the personification of that. That's interesting. That's and, really interesting. And the, the most important... I, I just, it gives you... Uh, the thing I can say to those listening is it gives you unbelievable certainty about the future because... That's real security, isn't it? I mean, it? it's unbelievable because there's no, you have so much critical mass. You have so many ways to have a value to people's lives. You don't ever have to be concerned about, well, can I do this successfully or what if something happens? And so people looking at a comment, because I'm going to predetermine a question people are probably thinking to themselves. What an expense. Au contraire. I approach every pillar as what I'll call an innovative profit center. Okay. You should never do anything that doesn't produce a profitable outcome for you, that doesn't basically dovetail together, that doesn't reinforce and make everything else right. you do even stronger. Synergistic. Synergistic, exactly. So when you do that, that's what gives you this incredible... Let's give some people some examples. Give us some examples with some businesses that had the diving board metaphor. They had one basic pillar holding them up, and you helped them to build a Parthenon of strength and uh, well, endurance. Can I tell you how we, profitability. I'll tell you how we grew back in, in the high inflation days. Uh, precious metals were, were a very popular hedge, and I did a lot of work with people there. I can tell you we grew a company from $300,000 in sales to a half a billion in 18 months. That might be interesting. That might be fascinating. Let's try that. Okay. <laughs> I had a company that basically had no formalized marketing whatsoever. All they did basically was they had a relationship at that time with a small newsletter who occasionally recommended them. And whenever they made a recommendation, their phones would sort of ring and they would get business, and it was enough to keep the doors open. I saw that they were a very qualitative firm. They gave very good advice. They were understated. They dealt in what's called fiscal delivery, which is a very very clean and a very ethical way of transacting business. You got the goods. They didn't hold them for you. It was not a dangerous way to buy. So I set out to identify the most safe and logical ways to grow their business exponentially and build many pillars. The first thing I did was they sold gold, and they sold silver, and they sold rare coins. But if you bought one, they just sort of dropped you. So the first thing I thought was, what's the logical dynamic that happens in a selling situation? I'm just going through the whole, the whole context. If you buy gold from somebody or any investment, unless you're really not very prudent, it's very rare that you make anywhere close to your capacity of investment initially. You want to see how the, the entity performs, the salesperson performs, and the investment medium performs. You're not giving them all your money, in other words, basically. So I figured if we set our whole approach at understating and underselling, not overselling, and basically not even allowing people to spend to their capacity, but but compelling them to spend less. Our goal should be first to get them comfortable and satisfied with the investment. Second, to sell them more of the investment. Third, to take them to a lateral investment. So we'd basically try to sell them a little bit of gold, then a little bit more. After that, we'd sell them a little bit of silver. It was a little bit a little bit and more. along the way, under-promising and over-delivering. Always under-promising and over-not promising in the world, but just promising it for a hedge. Not right. saying it could go up or down, but it, if it goes down, it's purpose. Giving it a different context, then you're going to get rich quick. Okay. The opposite. Not make money, but it was a counter-investment. And we basically performed, and we delivered, and we were honest, and we were understated. All the while, we educated. We went out and we bought all kinds of material that gave very well-balanced, objective perspectives. Not always good perspectives. And we did this. Okay, as I'm doing that, I'm getting greater residual value out of my customers. That was the first pillar. In other words, you're going back to those three things you talked about, mm-hmm. optimizing a business or growing yeah. a business. Because that's the easiest source of increased capital you've got in any business is your satisfied past customers. And getting them to buy again or again buy again. more of. Right. right. So we did that. Then we went back to the first and the only source of business, which is one newsletter. They had occasionally, not formally implicitly, explicitly endorsed us, but not on a concerted, systematized manner. Okay. So only because no one asked them. I went to them and I said, well, do you believe our company is good? And they said, yeah, you're the best. Do you trust us? Yes, we have impeccable faith in your integrity. I said, well, then let's, so people don't make a mistake and get buried by somebody else. Let's formalize this. So I set up a program where every time a new, a new subscriber came in, they got a new member kit that told them that we were the recommended dealer and they gave them a buying advantage and they gave them information. I set up a regular 
four time a year insert in their newsletter that promoted us. Once every six months, we mailed externally an endorsed letter for them and a direction to action. That was the first thing. That worked masterfully, massively, in fact. When that worked, I thought, hmm, should we be satisfied with one or should we replicate it? So I went out <laughs> systematically and set up relations with all kinds of other people. So you began to leverage, just like we talked about earlier. Cookie cutter. Then I went and I decided, I studied, why don't people buy gold or silver or precious metals? And I realized they were afraid. They were afraid they'd make a mistake, they'd get burned. So I went and I started making offers for people to try. And when I tell you this, it's really cute. We sold millions of dollars of rare coins with a simple process that's so wonderfully delightful. I loved it. We took silver dollars back when silver dollars were very popular. And they were, our wholesale cost of them was about $21. I sold two Morgan silver dollars that cost me $21 for $19 as part of the test. And I, I did letters and I did ads and they basically said, this was, a, this was another pillar. It basically said, too many people are trying to get you to spend five or $10,000 on an investment form or a collectible form that may or may not be right for you. We don't think that's correct. We think you should first get comfortable. You think you should study for yourself privately you know, the case, the investment. So we went out and we bought $100 worth of research reports, all kinds of interviews with all kinds of respected, unimpeachable experts. But we were able to reproduce them in mass quantity for like $3. Right. And we paid just royalties for them. So we gave them $100 worth of information that was unduplicatable, including interviews with people who thought gold, silver, and rare coins stunk because we wanted to be balanced. We wanted to make their own. Great. Experience. We gave them the rationale historically. We gave them an Austrian school of economics perspective. We gave them the downside, the upside, and we sent them two coins because we felt you couldn't understand why all the interest unless you held them in your hand. You mm -hmm. saw the, all the historic significance. You thought about what happened back 100 years ago. You saw the unbelievable mystical effect silver could have in your hand. Then we said, take 15 days and decide if this, the investment is right for you. If it is, we would hope, reading everything that's been said and also a lot of the testimonials, because we've got lots of people to talk about our integrity, you'd favor us. If you don't, you have two choices. You can keep the coin because it's nice to have. If you don't want to keep it, send it back to us and we'll give you $21, not the 19 you spent, because frankly, it cost us 21 wholesale. And we want you to be able to say that the one investment you made in rare coins, you made a profit. <laughs> I sold 100,000 people. A, this is very, this is goes the back. 100,000 people, and I'm going to be a little bit off because I can't remember the exact dynamics, a trial $19 sale. Of the 100,000, approximately 10,000 bought from us at least $5,000 worth. Of the, the 10,000, approximately 1,000 bought at least $10,000 more. Of the 1,000, approximately 300 bought at least fifty dollars to $100,000 more. Of the 90,000 that didn't buy originally, I was able to go back to and got another 10,000 over the year to buy again. And, it, and that one little gesture added about $10 million to our business. That's another pillar. At the same time, I went to all the book publishers and every great economic book that became out of print or, or didn't sell, I bought and I would distribute to people free with a letter that we thought that we think the investment in gold and silver or your outlook of the economy is so important that we wanted you to get a balanced opinion. So we bought this where there's no obligation. We hope only that you'll read chapter 20 about precious metals. And if it makes sense, give us a call. We were doing that all the time. I went to Intergold, which then became the World Gold Council, which was the marketing conduit for crew brands before they outlawed them. I showed them that I had a better strategy for educating and compelling people to start owning gold. And, and you have to understand, back before they disallowed the Krugerrand, the Krugerrand was the most brilliant marketing strategy of them all. Do you know why? No. Because basically, whatever gold sold for, the Krugerrand sold for about 2 or 3% more. All it was was an innovative way that all the mines in South Africa came up with for getting a premium on gold by calling it something different and molding it. So they were making $150 million a year premium just on this form of selling gold. I got them to give us a million dollars for underwriting about 2 million 30-page brochures we sent out where we took two prominent economists who paid them each two grand for an interview. They had uh, contradictory sides, but they both agreed on precious metals. And we sent that out with their, and both of them happened to respect us. At the same time, I had offers for starter kits for gold. At the same time, I used direct mail. That's another pillar. Then because we got most of our business from when we brought in leads, a lead for investment can cost you $20, $30, $50 a sure. piece. And then it's a deferred investment. You don't get back a profit for months sometimes. We found that our most viable form of lead prospect was a subscriber to a newsletter. So I went to all the newsletters, and most of the newsletter publishers were not back-end oriented. They weren't very astute in back-end. 
So I went to them, and whenever a newsletter promotion piece stopped making a profit, they would stop running it. We would take over running it at a break-even as long as they gave us joint tenancy of the names, they gave us absolute endorsement, they gave us inserts in their newsletter, they put us in their starter packet, so we, instead of losing $25 on a lead, would start breaking even and making a profit. And I had like dozens of these things happen concurrently, and they all coalesced. And the total for the business again was what? Well, it, it, it got in its peak year. It went from 300000 to $500 million in 18 months. <laughs> now, I should tell you, it's a little misleading. We only made about $25 because it's a low-margin business, but it was very profitable. Interesting. Interesting. Is that well, a good those, example? Uh, I think it's a fairly good example. So it's basically not being content. If I had just basically <laughs> contented myself, and I made $2 million from the transaction, so I should tell you, if I had contented myself with only operating the one pillar they were doing, I would have made on my variable compensation literally about twenty five hundred dollars that year. So it was a, a it was the difference was what a hundred times. Amazing. It was easier to do and it was harder to kill the business. I stopped working with them and those programs. You talk about critical mass and velocity. They kept working for them for two and a half more years before they had to replace. Them. A lot of people listening right now are thinking, this is fascinating. I think some people say, well, gosh, you know, you gave them the coin. That's the puppy dog clothes. You know, they had it in their hand. They were stuck there. You know, you're inducing reciprocation. You're, But, you know, the truth of the matter is that you can pick all the stuff apart. What's most fascinating is the intensity and passion in which you've hit all of them. In other words, you're figuring every single tool and how do you maximize. You're coming back to optimization. This program is continued on the opposite side.